this afternoon, uh, Associate Professor Peter McCready, who's going to talk to us about uh, his blue carbon uh, um, work. Associate Professor Peter McCready is a marine scientist and global leader in uh, blue carbon. His research focuses on understanding and responding to the impacts of global change on aquatic ecosystems, namely marine but also freshwater. His approach to research is multidisciplinary, spanning the fields of chemistry, ecology, microbiology, economics, policy and molecular biology. Peter is head of uh, Deakin University's Blue Carbon Lab and holds the position of Associate Professor in Marine Science. So thanks very much, Peter, and it's all yours. Thanks, Brett. Uh, can everybody see my screen? No, if you just uh, right. I think they've got take over mode. again. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Brad. Uh, so Brad, if you don't know, this is running a new podcast and it's an unusual podcast. It's exploring humans behind the environmental science. And so we had a great chat also with Chris yesterday and about capitalism, media, pricing the environment and also about dads. Um, and it got me feeling quite nostalgic. And I thought that might be a good segue into my journey to blue carbon. And given that we do have Father's Day on Sunday, I might take a moment to reflect on uh my my the role of my father in this journey uh and i will also say i hope you like surprises when i saw who some of the people who were coming to today's webinar i've also added in teal carbon so you're gonna get two colors of carbon today so um brad worked with my father at rmit for a number of years and i don't think it's any coincidence that my dad is a scientist and i also became a scientist i remember my dad running experiments at school and at the cub scouts uh, one in particular, I remember he used to make these volcanoes. I don't know what chemicals went into them. And I think this was sort of before the days of, you know, all the OH&S regulations. And I think they eventually, that experiment got, got banned anyway. Um, my, my parents were quite liberal there. Um, but growing up, we spent heaps of time at the beach. And I suppose most Aussie kids probably do. But for me, uh, it, was, it was a little bit different. Um, and I know this sounds corny, but there was sort of this magical quality to the ocean and I came to have somewhat of an obsession with water um, and also with fish and fishing. Uh, this photo is of um, my Nana um, fishing for trout. Uh, Nana was Sri Lankan, grew up in a rubber plantation in Candy. That's another, another story. But anyway, I could not get enough of water and fish and uh, we traveled a lot because my dad was a scientist and we could never really have pets. And I think my wife will probably kill me for telling this. She says, it's just weird, but um, because we couldn't have pets and I was obsessed with fish, they let me keep a dead trout called Trouty that I'd caught from the trout farm. Um, super low maintenance pet. Um, I'd sit by the TV looking after Trouty or jumping on the trampoline with Trouty. And whenever he would get too soft, we'd just throw him back in the freezer. Um, I've had some kids myself, three of them, in fact. Uh, no frozen fish, but we do have a cheeky Jack Russell that's just joined the family and some chickens, which has been a nice distraction from all that's going on with stage four lockdown here in Melbourne. Um, but my obsession with the ocean, I think, has started to pass on to the kids as well. And I just love this photo on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, it's my daughter, Millie, when she couldn't join me on one of the field trips and we were in the northern uh, part of the US. And so she drew seagrass meadows on the deck and then put her head in a bucket and did her own snorkeling. Uh, so I ended up getting my degree from the University of Melbourne. Uh, I did a PhD studying fish, fish and seagrass. And I remember the day that I handed in my thesis, uh, I walked into, you know, Melbourne Uni has these just glorious buildings, this, you know, beautiful big old building. And I went in there to hand my thesis. It was a very big day for me. and. I walked up to the desk and I remember, um, you know, there was no one there. I ring the bell and there was a lady who sort of leaned back on the chair and I said, I'm here to hand in my PhD. And I don't know what I expected, you know, balloons or something. But anyway, it, it wasn't a very ceremonious occasion uh, handing in the thesis like I, I maybe I imagined it would be. So I signed my name in the book and put my thesis on a pile of other thesis, theses that had been handed in that day. And they came back to me with a, a balloon on a stick. And, you know, I had a lot of fun during my PhD and I learned a lot, but I remember coming home on the train sort of feeling like, you know, had 
my research had any real world impact. And it was something that sort of bothered me for a while was, you know, I didn't really feel like what I was doing at the time, you know, was really having impact. And so I sort of had a, went on a bit of a quest trying to find what was going to be the thing that I would focus on for the next stage of my career. Um, and I came across back in 2009, this, this report here titled blue carbon. And I had never heard of these two words before. And I remember I was just sitting in a meeting, flicking through this report, thinking, holy cow, if this is even half true, this is huge. And so I had a new obsession that started moving from fish on to blue carbon. And I also came across some other people too, who I, th I feel are also as obsessed as I am about blue carbon. And this is the blue carbon lab. Uh, so we launched in 2016. We're about a 50-50 mix of postdocs and PhD students. And I'd say we're quite different to most academic labs. We do a lot of team-based science with a focus on research that has a big impact outside of academia. And a lot of our projects don't come in with a focus on papers. And as you know, most of you are in academia, we're all obsessed with publishing. Um, we, we're really trying to focus on doing science that is having real world impact. And I guess the strange bit for us has been that even though we come into projects not looking for the papers, the papers seem to come out anyway. We seem to uh, have lots of um, publications coming from the research we're doing. So there's lots of stakeholder engagement. We work with banks, airlines, um, government, federal, state, and local government, philanthropy, NGOs. Um, now, a lot of the work I'm about to present in my talk, uh, the credit goes to, to these guys here. These are the team and you know the, the science muscle behind the operation. And I'm really showcasing a lot of the work on their behalf. And also we haven't been working alone either. We have a huge number of collaborators. This is a list of people that we uh, have published with or had grants with um, over the past decade. So it's really been an all hands on deck effort. Lots of diversity there. We've got ecologists, biogeochemists, spatial scientists, microbiologists, economists, and it's very multidisciplinary science. And I think that's what's made this blue carbon research much more interesting um, and also much more comprehensive. So I wanna set the scene and I've shown this uh, animation at so many talks and for me, it never gets old. So when we hear about climate change and we look at what the world is doing, there's a lot of emphasis on reducing emissions into the atmosphere. Um, you know, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. And indeed, that is a very important thing we must do. Um, this animation by Climate Visuals shows what it would look like if you were watching emissions. Each one of these blue bubbles represents one ton of CO2. And just to put things into perspective, um, the average Australian produces about 18 tons of CO2 uh, each year. So this is what one hour's worth of emissions look like from New York City. And in a moment, we'll see what it looks like after uh, one day and one year. Now, with all this focus on reducing emissions to the atmosphere, we don't hear so much about what do we do with all the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that we've already released to the atmosphere. Now, it's not something you think much about because we're talking about an invisible gas, many of these blue bubbles. In fact, this animation right now is showing you what one year's worth of emissions look like from New York City. There's 54 million tons of carbon dioxide. And it would be perhaps a climate change issue wouldn't be as much of an issue if we could visualize our emissions in this way. If we looked up in the sky and we saw them all up there. But my talk and uh, the quest that the lab has gone on really has been around um, what do you do with all the greenhouse gases that we've already released in the atmosphere? And they will be floating up around up there for hundreds of years. Now, the answer to that is biosequestration. So this is the natural process where plants take up carbon dioxide, they breathe it in, they keep the C, that's carbon, and they release oxygen. Ironically, this is the process that created fossil fuels in the first place. And now it is uh, the most important natural process that we need to capitalize on to help regain control of the planet's thermostat. Now, a lot of us, when we think about 
carbon drawdown, we think about forests, we think about trees. Um, and look, trees are important, they have their place, but for the most part, when you bind carbon within the green carbon pool, the trees, the carbon tends to be bound for the lifetime of a tree, which could be 50 years, 100 years. Um, it's not quite like for like, if you're burning a fossil fuel and then you're planting a forest, even though we often do this when we do carbon offsetting, they're not the same. So that's why there needs to be more emphasis on biosequestration from the ecosystems that created fossil fuels in the first place, which is the wetlands. So we've got blue carbon ecosystems and teal carbon ecosystems. Blue carbon is carbon that is captured and stored in the oceans. Teal carbon is carbon that is uh, stored in freshwater ecosystems, wetlands. So we've learned that um, blue carbon ecosystems cover less than 1% of the sea floor, yet they sequester more than half the ocean's carbon. And the heavy lifting is mainly being done, or at least to our knowledge to this point, by three ecosystems. You've got seagrass meadows, tidal marshes, and mangrove forests. And, and we call it blue carbon simply because the ocean is blue. Very creative of us. So back when blue carbon first started hitting the headlines a little over a decade ago, uh, this was some data that was um, really exciting for a lot of us in this space where they tried to put blue carbon and green carbon ecosystems head to head. And what we'd found from that was that blue carbon ecosystems, when you compare them in terms of carbon drawdown into the ground, they'll capture and store carbon at a rate uh, around 35, 40 times faster than green carbon ecosystems. So not surprisingly, that got a lot of carbon offset providers excited. You know, for every tonne of um, blue carbon ecosystem, you'd need 40 tonnes of green carbon ecosystem to do the same amount of carbon drawdown. Um, now, uh, to be honest, it's not a fair comparison. They store carbon very, very differently. Um, but they do have some other really important features. And one of them, and I've sort of alluded to this, is that they're really important for long-term carbon drawdown. So they will store the carbon in the ground for thousands of years. Another thing which um, I've added this in as a, a dot point um, since the fires in Australia earlier this year is that, you know, these healthy blue carbon ecosystems don't tend to catch on fire, which of course is a big risk and a liability for us with a lot of our green carbon projects. And then there are all these other just amazing co-benefits that I'll talk about a little later. So, you know, I've been showing you some very pretty pictures of these ecosystems, but, you know, this is the reality for me. This is um, doing some field work out at Real, just on the bridge when you head over to um, um, Churchill Island. Um, you know, some people ask, it's just mud, right? Oh, yeah, kind of. It is, it is mud, um, but, but so much more, and I hope to convince you of that. Uh, but perhaps not surprisingly, when you look at these ecosystems, you can understand why many Australians regard them as the armpits of our coastal environments. So, you know, when blue carbon started to sort of um, hit the headlines in the science world, uh, we went out and tried to figure out, well, how much blue carbon do we have around Australia? And many other countries did the same. How much blue carbon do we have in our backyards? And we asked questions like, where are the blue carbon stocks and why? Um, are we losing blue carbon under business as usual? And what are the opportunities for restoration, forward thinking? What might the future look like if we really want to capitalize on blue carbon opportunities? So we went off coring and we, you know, so we basically take cores in the ground and we pull them out, we analyze the carbon in there. It's, to be honest, it's a pretty expensive process and something we were asking ourselves in the early days, or I should say our financial sponsors were offering, asking us is how many cores do you really need to take? How, how much is enough? Um, we've got some very enthusiastic uh, blue carbon scientists within our group. If you asked uh, Dr. Paul Carnell, longtime colleague and member of the Blue Carbon Lab, he'd probably say, you just need one more. We're always getting one more core, uh, um, but our funders probably don't like that as an answer uh, too much. But anyway, this was a paper that was published by Mary Young, um, which showed that this magical number seems to be about 40 cores you would need uh, across an expanse of about 1,000 kilometres of coastline to get a pretty good idea of the level of carbon variance across that scale. Um, but you need more um, higher density sampling when you work at finer scales. 
So as I mentioned, it's pretty expensive doing this work and to do carbon stock assessments. And this was some really neat work using, um, we all love toys and tech, and this was Alejandro Navarro, um, who was a PhD student um, in Danny Radaikenau's lab, where he was using UAVs to estimate carbon bound within salt marsh and um, mangrove biomass. And, and in this, he's found that you can cover the area of a size of a football field in about one hour. So it's about 500 times faster than if we were to send a team out there into the wetland. It probably doesn't bode well for many of us who have aspirations to be research assistants with machines around there doing the work for us at a fraction of the cost. But anyway, it is an exciting development there. So it ends up to be a saving of about $25,000 per hectare. Another way that we wanted to try and bring together the blue carbon community to understand blue carbon dynamics. In this case, it's about um, why are some wetlands better at preserving carbon than others? Uh, this is a project led by Dr. Stacey Trevathan Tackett. Um, she uh, developed this program called T-Composition H2O. And what it's doing is it's using household tea bags to study how well wetlands preserve carbon. And I'll explain how that works. So they're, they're Lipton tea bags, and we've deployed, I believe it's a little over 20,000 tea bags now across 30 countries and more than 300 sites around the world. But the tea, green tea and red tea, they have a very standardized type of carbon in there. And you can um, study the rate at which that carbon breaks down over time and then compare wetlands in a standardized way. So it's a very standard technique. And so, you know, we've got all these tea bags uh, yeah, more than 20,000 of them around the world now. Um, and a lot of the data is starting to come in now. And it's just fascinating to understand or to see some wetlands are really good where the, the tea three years later is still there, hasn't disappeared, hasn't been munched up by microbes. Um, and in other sites, it, it's just gone in a flash, which would probably indicate, well, that's a lousy place for storing carbon. And if you want to jump on the website there, Tea Composition H2O, you can find out more about that project. But um, getting back to Australia, which is probably where a lot of our interests lie. Uh, so we went on this massive coring campaign, many scientists around Australia, CSIRO did a lot to uh, bankroll this project. And uh, what we found was that, and this work has been published by a good colleague of mine, Oscar Serrano in Nature um, Communications in last year, that Australia has more blue carbon than anywhere else in the world. We've got about five to 11% of the world's blue carbon. Um, and the amount of blue carbon we're finding in these environments dwarfs that um, compared to their terrestrial counterparts. And this is also a very conservative estimate because we're only looking at the top meter, but in fact, these ecosystems store carbon for meters and meters and meters. Um, if you're talking about the annual rate at which they're drawing down carbon, it's about 5.5 million tonnes of carbon sequestered annually. To put that into perspective, that's enough to offset about half of Australia's vehicle emissions or about four to 6% of all CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels. However, we are still losing these ecosystems at about one to 2% per year. And if that carbon is released back into the atmosphere when we destroy these ecosystems, it's equivalent to the emissions of about um, up to 21% of emissions from land use. So it's, it could be up to having an extra 10 million cars on the road and it's an invisible gas, no one sees it. Um, and unfortunately, our latest modeling does show that under business as usual scenarios with climate change in the future, we are gonna to continue to lose these ecosystems, particularly with sea level rise. And this video sort of shows what this process looks like of taking carbon cores, extracting the carbon and measuring them. So um, just a bit more on that concept of losing blue carbon. We've got a growing body of evidence that suggests that um, when you damage these blue carbon ecosystems, the carbon disappears. It's a bit like letting off a carbon bomb. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's physical or biological or chemical forms of disturbance. We've got research that shows that you can lose a lot of that ancient carbon. Um, there's a study here in Jervis Bay. You're looking at that video on your far left um, where we found that we lost about a thousand years worth of a carbon after destroying seagrass meadows due to industrial development about 50 years ago. Um, there was a paper published by Trisha Atwood where we found, this is really bizarre, but loss of top predators, we're talking sharks and things like that, can have cascading effects that can influence the amount of blue carbon. In the shark example, it's um, 
you know, fewer sharks and then you have more turtles, more turtles eat more seagrass and there's less carbon being drawn down. It's quite intuitive, um, but perhaps was surprising that the data actually supported what um, was a, just a hypothesis for quite a long time. And then uh, eutrophication, which is basically nutrient runoff into the coastal zone. We found that at the site of European settlement in 1788, so this is Botany Bay, we've seen a 100-fold weakening in the capacity of Botany Bay to sequester carbon over that time. Um, so um, this is a, an important um, area of research for us. Um, but it, you know, this is about loss of blue carbon. One thing that really challenged us was, you know, can you actually prove that that carbon, even though it's lost, ends up in the atmosphere and actually accelerates climate change? Um, and so we've got a new project on that. It's funded by the Australian Research Council. Um, hey, look, if you're in science and you feel like you have a lot of rejections, um, you're in good company. Um, this was an ARC grant I submitted five times and it's finally um, been supported last year. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a tough field we're in, but this project is going to really start to interrogate, you know, why does some carbon hang around for thousands of years and others disappears within sort of seconds or minutes. And what we have found has been something surprising recently that if you take some of this really ancient carbon, in this particular study here, we took carbon that was 5,000 years old and we exposed it to microbes. And even though it was really old and we thought, um, or we showed, we showed was very chemically recalcitrant. And in other words, it was very, we thought it was gonna be very inaccessible to microbial attack we actually found a 34 to 38 fold increase in carbon turnover um, when we exposed ancient sediments to, to oxygen. And it would seem that the oxygen, it's like, it's like a trigger just to wake up microbes and cause them to metabolize this ancient carbon. Looking to the future, um, you know, even though I've, mentioned that this could be, we could be losing a lot of blue carbon in the future. There's also a fantastic opportunity here to um, plan for sea level rise and to plan for opportunities to have more blue carbon. So we're just about to submit a paper. It's gonna, we're gonna hope to hit the submit button tomorrow where we ask the question, if you really wanted to protect and restore blue carbon ecosystems around the world, what percentage of global emissions could be offset? Now, I know this number might not seem big to some of you, but I think it's bloody huge and I'm really impressed by it. You could offset uh, about 3% of global emissions if you were to do large scale restoration and protection. And, and from that 3%, it's about 70% from restoration and about 30% from protection. And I wanna give a plug to uh, one of Blue Carbon Lab's newest members, Dr. Michelle Costa, um, an amazing modeler and scientist who's gonna be talking tomorrow for um, Deakin University Center for Integrative Ecology se seminar series. She's got, just finished a project. Uh, we've had some great sponsorship behind this project. Uh, it involves the um, Queensland government where we were put to task to try and figure out how much blue carbon could you have in the Great Barrier Reef catchment, and importantly, where should you act? So where are you gonna get the best bang for your carbon buck? So if you wanna join that talk, and I think the slide here says 12 o'clock, we've had to shift it a little bit because we got a surprise email about a, uh, a staff meeting tomorrow, no doubt due to everything that's happening with COVID and job cuts across the university sector, but I believe it's now set for 12.30. If you wanna dial into that talk and hear all about uh, Michelle's great work on blue carbon and where we should act around the Great Barrier Reef catchment. And I'm not gonna spoil the uh, spoil her talk by telling you what the numbers are, but it is pretty impressive what we could be doing in the Great Barrier Reef catchment. Now, you might think that restoration and on-ground actions are something that should be done by green armies, council workers, NGOs, groups like that. Now, we wanted as a lab to connect more with on-ground actions. And this was about giving ourselves a reality check about what it's really like to do restoration. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I don't know how many of my papers I have finished with in the abstract saying something like, you know, we recommend policy makers and land managers do blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm recommending stuff that I have never done myself. So, you know, as a lab, I guess we thought we really should start doing restoration just to see what's involved. Maybe in fact, there's gonna be an opportunity for us to use our science to make restoration outcomes better. 
And we were very fortunate that our state government, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, I think that's what they're still called this week. Anyway, they gave us a shot. And this was getting some funding from their biodiversity response planning program. I think it was something like $43 million was put into this. Um, Victorian government's quite concerned about losing more species, and we should be. In fact, this um, picture here, this background image, is of orange-bellied parrot habitat. And I believe it's estimated that there's only about 50 of these birds left in the wild, like in the wild total in the world. It is the world's most endangered species. And for those of you in Melbourne on this webinar, um, you'll find that there's some great sites where you can potentially see them, one of the 50 birds in the world, um, around uh, Western Port and also around the Western side of Port Phillip Bay. Anyway, so this project had quite a number of stakeholders, which is great to see. It shows the interest in um, getting restoration outcomes happening, and they're shown down the bottom of the screen. Uh, this program, big shout out to Dr. Melissa Wartman from Blue Carbon Lab. Um, she has done an absolutely incredible job in leading this program, and she's just released a story map where you can um, see what has been done over the past few years in this program and we're at a point where we really hope to scale up so if any of you are listening on this call and you're not a scientist but maybe you have deep pockets and you want to fund something please fund this um, our scaling up of this this is a great opportunity okay so I'm going to quickly run through the programs so the first program was to develop a restoration action plan for Avalon Coastal Park uh, shout out to UNSW Water Research Lab, our close collaborators on this project. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this site, it's a low-lying coastal area on the northern side of Corio Bay. So it sits um, just south of Avalon Airport. And it was a site that was a famous um, site of a famous film in 1978, 79, starring Mel Gibson. If you can guess it, you're seeing some footage of it right here in that video in the middle. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a chat box on this webinar, but if you know the answer of what film it was, type it in the bottom for you movie buffs. Um, uh, it shows, uh, I grabbed this off the web, there was a guy who went out there and showed what the site looks like now and back in 1979 when they filmed this. And not much has changed, it's incredible. It's, it's an area called the Shacks, um, but it sits um, at the doorstep of Cheatham Salt Works. So Cheatham Salt Works were established back in 1888 and we used for harvesting salt and um, that stopped back in 2002. So um, it's become a really important um, site for birds and for other wildlife and we're looking to restore this site. Um, and the answer to that question, I don't know if anybody got it, but it, this is the site of Mad Max 1. It's the scene where uh, Jesse pops off to get an ice cream from the shop just down the beach and gets hassled by the toe cutter gang. Uh, so our objective at this project is to try and um, look at different restoration scenarios for this site and understand what might be the different ecosystem service trade-offs. And I'll talk about it more ecosystem services in a moment, a little bit more. And we're going to be finished this project in about 12 months and we hope that those the findings will encourage our government to then restore this site, which is quite degraded right now. Um, just one thing we've learnt recently, this is sort of... Um, stuff, data that's hot off the press, we've learned that um, these salt ponds are, are no longer accumulating carbon. And this is something we see a lot in a lot of the degraded sites, the sites that we've um, destroyed with European settlement. Maybe it's a no brainer, but um, it was a surprise to us that um, there's just nothing, no carbon accumulating within these salt ponds. And um, uh, Will Glamour and his team at UNSW Water Research Lab has been asking a question um, that was something we didn't think a lot about and we're probably quite naive to, which is that if you are going to start to restore a lot of these sites, the best way to do that is to restore tidal exchange. So bring back the tides and you're bringing them back to where they used to be. So you're just bringing back the salt water. But if you've ever had a leaking roof, it is really hard to figure out where the water is coming from and where the water is going to go. And um, Will's just finished some great modeling that you're watching right now, which shows if we do remove these bun walls, exactly where will the water penetrate? And we wanted to make sure that we're not going to be flooding people's backyards or roads or other infrastructure. Program number two. Uh, this is probably the program that uh, has one of the greatest potentials for upscaling. Um, with some of our partners like um, uh, Greening Australia and others, um, some of the catchment management authorities, they've been doing this fencing work for a long time. And so we were quite new to it. But um, fencing is just a great way to achieve low cost, passive restoration. Um, 
And, you know, we've been had some great success working with local farmers. You're looking at one of them on the top right there, where we come into the property, install a fence, and we exclude cattle from grazing on salt marsh in this case. So on that image here, you're looking on the left hand side is area that's still actively grazed. And on the right hand side, you're seeing an area that used to look like that, but now we've got a fence to exclude cattle and you see this gorgeous salt marsh starting to come back. And that salt marsh is very important for carbon drawdown, as I hope I've convinced you of already. Um, and just uh, some modeling we've done as a lab very recently, we estimate there's about 30,000 hectares of land along the Victorian coast where we could upscale and do this fencing work. And if we did that, you'd draw down conservatively about an extra 27,000 tonnes of CO2, of carbon per annum. So big opportunities here right at our doorstep here in Victoria. Program three uh, is working with Indigenous communities. Uh, now, Indigenous communities have long regarded wetlands as really important for their livelihoods. Uh, our traditional owners regard them as their supermarkets, their hardware stores, their pharmacies. These are places where you can get everything you need to sustain yourself and life. And European settlers came in and felt very differently. Um, they thought that they were unproductive areas of little practical value. And even in the English language today, we still have these negative connotations towards wetlands. You know, we get bogged down in detail. We get swamped with work. We've got the mythical boogeyman and the bay wolf coming from these swampy wetlands. Um, and European settlers in total have destroyed about 8 million football fields worth of wetlands in terms of area. And this um, chart on the bottom right hand side of your screen is an 1863 chart. And you might recognize you've got the Yarra River there and you've got so many wetlands. Melbourne had heaps of wetlands and now we've got cities, we've got infrastructure, we've drained the vast number of those wetlands. So in this program here, we're working with traditional owners to try and bring back the land to its pre-European state. And we have no idea what that was. So we're really relying on the traditional owners and we're helping to facilitate um, some restoration recovery at some important sites here. This is the um, Point Lilia site um, uh, there. So really cool stuff. Uh, now I wanna take you to the fourth and final program under our coastal work and restoration program. This is community engagement. Now, often when we get money from sponsors, we don't always engage them in the research itself. And um, we, or I should say, Dr. Maria Palacios, absolute superstar of Blue Carbon Lab, has been running this two-year program with HSBC Bank, taking out their employees, I think there's over 350 of them, out into wetlands in Sydney, Melbourne, and Auckland, and getting them involved in our science. Um, because Maria did a, such a tremendous job, this program won the 2019 Australian Financial Review Award for Industry Engagement. And what we found is that these immersive experiences are really creating behavioural change. And importantly, if you've been watching the headlines lately, HSBC has been all over them as investing in natural capital. So nature, what nature does for us and for humanity. Uh, they're investing over $100 billion in sustainable finance. And they wanted to make sure that the people who are making decisions behind the board table within their organisation understand how those decisions could affect climate change and things like that. Now, I wanna talk about the co-benefits. For those of you who lived in Australia back and you were around in the 80s, you might remember these um, Tim Shaw ads from Dentel where he brings out the steak knives and he was always, you want more? Well, this is the part where I'm gonna give you more. If, you, if, if carbon drawdown wasn't enough for you, here's where uh, it gets even more exciting. And this was a program called Mapping Ocean Wealth. Uh, it was a program that was initiated by the Nature Conservancy and uh, it was co-investment from these other groups here. Shout out to my colleagues, Daniel Iridaikanal and Dr. Emily Nicholson, Paul Carnell, who were instrumental in running this program and the many scientists involved. And what this program sought to do was to put into quantitative terms what Australia's coastal wetlands do for us in terms of measurable benefits. So we looked at fisheries, we looked at tourism and recreation, blue carbon and coastal protection. And the other thing to come from this program was to not like, it's, you see these big numbers come out, you know, we all know this paper from, you know, Bob Costanza in 97 that was published in Nature about, you know, the enormous wealth we get from the oceans and, and the numbers are big, but I think people have become a bit desensitized to those numbers as important as they are. A lot of us who are working at the coal face of managing these systems want to know 
show me like where exactly is this, is this value? So we had the task of in a very spatially explicit way, trying to map these values and maps are one of the oldest forms of nonverbal communication. This is a, one of the world's oldest maps. It's um, estimated to be from um, more than 6,000 years before Christ. It's found in Turkey and it's a wall painting showing um, streets and houses and a town and a nearby volcano. It was kind of like, hey, everybody watch out for this volcano. Um, and maps are still a big deal today. As we all know, Google and Apple are spending an absolute fortune investing in maps. So this is an example of one of the maps that we produced, um, in this case, blue carbon. Um, where is the blue carbon around Port Phillip Bay and Western Port Bay? And if you follow that link there, it'll take you to um, a portal where you can look at all the different data sets that uh, we've generated as a part of this Mapping Ocean Wealth program. And I just wanna quickly touch on some of the non-blue carbon benefits here. Um, so you've got recreation. I, I didn't think there was a lot of recreation that happened in wetlands. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we often regard these as armpits of the coast, but as it turns out, there's a lot of bird watching. And I was chatting to Chris yesterday on the podcast. His dad's an avid bird watcher. Um, and some of these bird watchers are spending a lot of money to watch birds. So we did an economic analysis looking at um, the value of that uh, bird watching. And bird watchers were spending on average about $158 per visit to go out and see birds. And they're often doing these visits to see birds intentionally. Um, they, that was the sole purpose of their uh, trip. And in fact, we had this big spike in the data one day and we were trying to figure out what had happened that day. And it was a couple of years ago. And I don't know if anybody remembers, but there was this bird that turned up in a wetland in Western Port, not just any wetland, a sewage treatment pond from the Western Treatment Plant, which is managed by Melbourne Water. Um, if you know what this bird was, it's very common in the Northern Hemisphere and it um, is often referred to as the Danny Zuko duck, uh, but it's the male tufted duck. I don't know much about birds, I don't know much about ducks, but I would have thought that if this bird, if it's the first time this bird has been seen in Australia or in the Southern Hemisphere, I was kind of surprised that no one spotted it on its way down to Melbourne, um, but it turned up in this wetland and this, this group of bird watchers, there's like 10 of them or something, they spent over $130,000 coming to see this bird, this once in a lifetime opportunity to see the male tufted duck. We also looked at seagrasses and the contribution that seagrasses make to uh, recreational fisheries. And um, we estimate there's about $33 million in value just in Port Phillip Bay alone. Uh, we looked at coastal protection. This is some work led by um, PhD student Kelvin Jaya, um, amazing work. A lot of it's still coming out at the moment. Uh, it's also in collaboration with um, University of Melbourne, uh, Becky Morris and colleagues there, Ruth Reef from Monash University, um, estimating wave attenuation by coastal wetlands. Now I've seen this firsthand. I, I visited Gulf of Mexico just after Hurricane Katrina and I got to have a tour of the coast and see areas where they still had um, healthy mangroves, healthy salt marsh. And you'd stand there at the site and you sort of wouldn't really feel like there had been a cyclone, um, a hurricane come through. Um, and then you go to areas where they've been removed and the destruction was just incredible. And so um, Kelvin Jaya has been um, putting some numbers behind this um, and he's, he's found here locally. This is local data that our um, local blue carbon environments, blue carbon ecosystems, sorry for the jargon here, BCE, that's blue carbon ecosystems. Uh, they're attenuating wave energy by about 37 to 71%. And in terms of avoided damages to coastal infrastructure in Australia, they're providing $2.7 billion per year in value. Perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of that's coming from mangroves. Uh, I've got um, a, a colleague who's got a yacht up in um, Cairns and whenever the cyclones are coming through, you know, they, they drive their yachts up into the mangrove forests. You know, you're better off there than trying to pull it into a boat shed. Um, seagrasses are probably a little underrepresented here because they're doing a lot to prevent erosion and it's not really something we can pick up too well in the way we're measuring wave attenuation. Uh, moving on to fisheries enhancement, uh, we've known for a very long time that fish, that seagrass meadows in particular, but also tidal marshes and mangroves, are really important for supporting our fisheries. They're like the nursery grounds for fish. In fact, it's been estimated that something like half the world's fisheries um, come from these ecosystems. 
And in this study, so it's an Australian based study, we found that blue carbon ecosystems, um, shout out to Holger Yanez who led this work. They provide about 61% of the diet for coastal fish, uh, those fish that are targeted by recreational and commercial fishers. And um, just per hectare, these seagrass meadows, uh, this was a, a review that was published in um, Fish and Fisheries, um, that you know, one hectare, so it's about like one football field of seagrass meadow is producing about 55,000 more fish per year than bare sediment. So really important ecosystems, they're doing a lot for us and we need to um, look after them. Okay, we're sort of on the home straight here. Uh, what about macroalgae? I'm preempting a question I often get in these talks. So seaweed, what, what about seaweed? And um, uh, uh, Alicia Belgrove and also PhD student Erlania uh, has, have been doing some great work here, trying to fingerprint carbon in offshore sediments. So, you know, the problem with macroalgae is that they tend to grow on hard substrates. Well, it's not a problem, but they grow on hard substrates and they don't tend to draw down carbon in the sediment below them like seagrass, mangroves and tidal marshes do. So then what contribution might they be making to blue carbon? Now, there is so much macroalgae, so much seaweed around the Australian coastline. In fact, just in terms of area, it's about 250,000 square kilometres, which is about an area the size of Victoria. And if you estimate the amount of carbon that is produced each year by all of Australia's macroalgae, it's about a bit over 100 million tonnes of carbon. Now, if 100% of this is sequestered in the oceans, as unlikely as that might be, but just bear with me here, if 100% was sequestered, it would almost be enough to offset all of Australia's emissions. It's not accounted for in our national greenhouse gas inventory. We have no idea if it's 100% or 0%. It's something in between. Um, and Elania is doing some fantastic work where she's using these um, chemical biomarkers, eDNA and other techniques to try and take sediment samples and figure out how much carbon within this sample is from a blue, from a seaweed um, source. Um, so watch that space. All right, onto teal carbon, and I promise you I won't um, faff about with this. I'll, I'll get straight to the point. I've spent a lot of time already talking about blue carbon. Um, so teal carbon. Um, well, uh, teal carbon, so it's carbon that's captured and stored by freshwater ecosystems. We have a lot of different type of freshwater ecosystems here in Australia. Um, there's some of them there on your screen. And, and very little has been known about carbon storage by these Australian wetlands. And some of them are quite ephemeral. So they come and go. And they can actually be carbon sinks or sources. And I guess we're trying to figure out which of these types of wetlands are um, most important for carbon drawdown. Um, what we have learned is there seems to be some sort of Goldilocks phenomenon going on here in Australia, where if it's too hot, they don't sequester that much carbon. If they're too cold, not too much. It's these temperate environments that are just right for storing carbon. Just to throw out some numbers here, Victorian wetlands store about 143 million tonnes of carbon. Um, sequestration each year is about 3.2 million tonnes per annum, which is not as much, sorry, actually this is just Victoria. It's not as much as what we're getting in blue carbon environments, but there's huge land areas and uh, where we can do a lot of this work. But we're also releasing a lot of emissions um, since European settlement as we destroy these ecosystems. Um, some news that probably the ag sector might not want to hear um, unless they're prepared to change, but that if we exclude sheep from uh, these ecosystems, we can increase the amount of above and below ground carbon. And also we found that when we put water back into these ecosystems, we see greenhouse gas emissions drop dramatically. Um, shout out to colleague here, Damien Maher, just demonstrating um, when these ecosystems are sometimes sources of carbon, when they're really degraded, um, they release a lot of methane. So this is a, a program we had in partnership with the Murray Local Land Services. It's called the Murray Wetland Carbon Program. Um, proud to say our partnership with them has led to restoring a little over 3,000 hectares of wetland over the past four years, 40 sites, and about 20, 24 landholders have been involved in that program. Um, farm dams. Uh, I think we all know what these are. When you fly in and out of Melbourne, you see lots of them along the landscape. Um, so I was at an IPCC meeting back in 2006. Um, I had the pleasure of attending, um, thanks to um, some colleagues at the Australian government. And um, they did this vote and, and they said, hey, does anybody know anything about farm dams? 
um, you know, is there any research? We'll come back after the break. And then as it came, we came back after the break and there was no published papers on emissions from farm dams. And um, so they did a vote on whether or not we should try and get some data and include uh, farm dams in the international greenhouse gas carbon budgets. And I could see um, the, the poor crew from the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory in Australia, their heads drop as they hear this in it because we've got heaps of farm dams and, and no one knew how many farm dams we had and whether they were potentially sources of emissions. But I think we all had an idea that they could be pretty big. Um, Queen Olivier, who was a PhD student in Blue Carbon Lab and was sponsored by Kerengamite Catchment Management Authority. Um, big shout out to Chris Pitfield there who um, found us some money for that scholarship there. Um, Quinn went out and started to measure emissions from these farm dams and he found that um, Victorian farm dams emit as much greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide equivalent to an extra 385,000 cars on the road each day. So per unit area, they're one of the largest sources of emissions of any water body we have. Now the baton has been grabbed by Dr. Martino Malerba, thanks to Deacon for um, sponsoring this um, incredible scientist for the next two years, who's trying to figure out how many farm dams we have across Australia. Uh, he's only been with the lab uh, for a few months now, and he's already submitted a paper on this where he's used remote sensing technology um, and um, you know, machine-based learning to try and figure out how many farm dams we have. And it turns out we've got over 2 million farm dams and the amount of water in these farm dams is uh, 10,000 gigalitres. And I had to look up what is a gigalitre, but it's about the water capacity of 16 Sydney harbours. Um, or in other terms, it's about 13% of all the water um, that the ag sector uses. So huge amount of water is locked up in these farm dams. We know that they're a major source of emissions. Um, and actually Martino also found that about 15% of the farm dams are unreported. I, I think you meant to report them a bit like swimming pools. So for safety reasons, there's about 15% of um, these uh, farm dams are unreported. So huge source of emissions. It's about, we estimate about 12% of emissions um, of the transport sector. Um, it's equivalent to all the emissions from waste use in Australia and about 4% of Australia's total emissions. And there's some real hot spots, as you can see on the map, the areas in red. So these are these urbanized areas, New South Wales, Queensland. Now, I guess we like to take a problem and find a solution, you know, turning lemons into lemonade. And so um, once again, if there are any people with deep pockets on the call, um, please consider sponsoring what we'd like to see as a multi-sector R&D program to trial low cost methods of managing farm dams to reduce those emissions. And it's possible that we could create a carbon crediting scheme where farmers collect carbon credits for reducing emissions from farm dams. Um, one of our colleagues, um, Tim Tupp, uh, has been um, creating these floating wetlands um, and they have the capacity to reduce evaporation, improve water quality, and also act as biodiversity hotspots for a lot of endangered fauna that are otherwise probably um, attacked by some of our non-native species, foxes and things like that. So that could be a real, a real potential win. I have no, no idea how long I've been talking for. I forgot to start my stopwatch, but I am going to leave it there. And if there happen to be any questions, I would love to hear them. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time and for listening, everybody. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, please join with me, everybody, and offer Peter a round of applause. You've got a little reaction button down the bottom, which you can uh, hit the uh, applause button.